My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that our government is shady, but every time I do, my family thinks I'm crazy. Like, oh, here we go, Mark. <laughs> Off again this with your... Mark being Mark again. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's the thing about podcasts is when you're on the air, and it's like therapy, you know? If I can't talk to my family about this stuff, I'll talk to you, Matt, and all our listeners. You know, tell your whole podcast. Yeah. So who are we talking about today, Matt? Let it rip, man. All these people are so terrible at what they do. This really makes me think that it's like some strange cult. And, and I start to think about cults like Nexium that weren't necessarily like religious cults as we would understand them, but like these strange sort of cults of personality. I mean, I think, you know, when all is said and done, and it, it might take a little while, but I, I, I definitely get this very <clears throat> strong sense that it's going to turn out that Biden is being handled by this cult. And there's some kind of metaphysics there. I mean, there's some sort of metaphysical thing there that, that starts to bring this whole situation into the, the world of sorcery. Another thing that drives you crazy about the conspiracy realm is like, oh, you know, everybody's a, a shill, everybody's a spy, everybody's a plant, and everything like that. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, I think after 20 or 30 years, you know, somebody like a David Icke or a Mark Dice or an Alex Jones, whether you agree with them or follow them or not, yeah, it's like, I think they've been vetted. <laughs> I think they've like sort of withstood the test of time. So I think that, you know, this whole notion that, you know, just I just see so often, it's always from like beginners and amateurs. If your eyes are truly open in this world of illusion, deception, and altered perceptions, you may have realized there is a deep level of sorcery at play. And now that the hundredth monkey has taken its bow, we stand at the crossroads knowing even though our families think we're crazy, we can't look back. And today's guest has been watching the technocrats take their last steps and gasp their last breaths. Author Chris Knowles is here to inform us on the ways we've been deceived and show us a way out, bringing us a lifetime of wisdom in the form of his Secret Sun Institute on Patreon. I encourage all of you to join me there. Stay tuned for a discussion with Chris Knowles on synchro mysticism and sorcery. I'm your host, Mystic Mark. Thank you for being here on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. and Enjoy this conversation with Chris Knowles. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. I'm your host, Mark Palmer, and on today's show, we have a returning guest who is long overdue. He joined us on the show all the way, way back when on episode 14, and more than 100 episodes later, he is here joining us again on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. And a lot has gone on since. Several really awesome appearances on podcasts I'm sure you listen to in conjunction with this one as well as some new developments on his blog, as to be expected, but also a Patreon, which I'm a part of. I'm not quite sure how long you've been doing. It looks like less than a year now, but it's off to a great start. And 
I'm excited to be there. So I hope we can get into a little bit of what's been going on in the... The Secret Sun Institute of Advanced Synchromysticism. Thank you, Chris. And that is what I hope oh, folks... The SSI for short, if you just, you know, SSI. If you... Okay. It's kind of like SRI, but not evil. Well, and I hope folks listening who aren't already a part of it take up the Patreon and join because it is full of the synchro juice or the sauce, as our friend Chance likes to say. And uh, synchro sauce, synchro sauce. Yes. And I, yeah, I got to ask you, how have you been lately, Chris? What have you been up to? I know you're recovering from a little bit of uh, congestion or whatnot, but you're feeling better today, though, right? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Cool. Good. Things, cool. Things are going well. Things are humming right along. Right. Got a lot of projects in the works. And in your your message to the Mystic series, you know, you inspired me as I was telling you before to revisit the Secret Teachings of All Ages, a book that you know I've always felt a sort of weird relationship to because, as I told you in the notes, my middle name is Palmer. Manly Palmer Hall. I don't know if that was a more common name in his times, but I just thought, you know, you don't hear that middle name very often, or especially as a first name anymore. Maybe well, Arnold Palmer Palmer. Eldritch, right? Mm. Palmer Eldritch. Who's that? You Philip K. Dickheads. Oh. Uh, the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. I'm it's not. Philip K. Dick novel. Not up on my Philip K. Dick that much, but but yeah, I just thought that was a, an interesting synchronicity there getting into it way back when and i've had this book for a long time and you know gravitated to different sections as my life went on but this chapter 31 on ceremonial magic and sorcery it brought a lot of things to the forefront that i think are worth touching on and i'm glad to have you here to get into it, but what inspired you to take a look back at that book in particular? I don't remember exactly how it came about, but I had seen something somewhere that it, it had was an excerpt from that chapter. And so I went back to the book and I reread the chapter and it just absolutely blew my mind because, you know, here's Palmer Hall, man, you know, mainly Palmer Hall laying this out a hundred years ago. You know, laying out the same kind of things that I was sort of struggling to define and struggling to catalog. And he's got it all right there on paper. And that's 100 years ago. It's just absolutely boggled my mind. Right. You know, but it, it just goes to show you that this is a, a longstanding process. You know, what I call the sorcerer archy, you know, ruled by sorcery. It's something that goes back a very long time. And it's also something that you can trace all around the world. It's not limited to any particular culture or region. It's just something that seems to be a natural evolution of, of cultures and societies, especially advanced ones. Agreed. And he pins it on the Atlantean culture as the source of that. And I know in the Patreon, you mentioned that, you know, Manly P. Hall had access to libraries within, you know, Freemasonic lodges and whatnot. That he did, yes. you know, these books are not commonly held. Maybe some people have them, but they're definitely not going to be found at Barnes and Noble. And I'm wondering, you know, how much further uh, do you think, man, or, or what do you think Manly P. Hall is is leaving out here? Because I know you can read between the lines better than most, and I think maybe it's worth reading a little bit here. He talks about. The pharaohs became a puppet in the hands of the Scarlet Council, a committee of arch sorcerers elevated to the power by the priesthood, which, you know, this is something that a lot of conspiracy theorists talk about. There's a hidden hand at play behind the, you know, the puppets that we see on the uh, world stage, right? So it's interesting to hear it from, from someone who was a Freemason himself. Well, it's not just conspiracy theorists. I mean, you know, we know about what Benjamin Disraeli had said back in the Victorian era. I mean, there have been people who popped up, you know, people of influence, people who are not just quote unquote conspiracy theorists, but people who are insiders who have discussed this whole phenomenon of weird kind of groups behind the scenes operating. And, you know, the thing that I, I had really been struck by when I read that chapter originally or recently was is how much it reminds me of what's going on with Joe Biden right now, where Joe Biden's clearly just a, a very, 
rapidly fading puppet for some weird, you know, it, it's, I got to tell you something. It almost feels like there's some sort of sect or cult behind this, because if you've been following politics, you know, you see the people in his cabinet and people around him. And it's just like, who are these people? You know, let's say, well, this, you know, he, this was undersecretary for this and, and this and that and the other thing. But it's like, it's not the usual kind of, you know, musical chair cabinet people that other, you know, like say the Obama administration had. It's just this weird group that seems very close knit and very secretive, obviously. Mm. Well, but, I mean, you know, you know what it reminds me of? Uh, do you remember, this was, I guess, a few years ago now, but there was a coup attempt. So there was a coup attempt that was staged in Turkey. And it, as it happened, as it turned out, it was some weird sect within the military that followed this guy, Gulen. And Gulen was, he was linked in with people like Hillary Clinton and John Kerry and all these kind of, you know, high highly placed people in the deep state and so on. So, you know, the prime minister of Turkey, who narrowly escaped with his life at the time, you know, distinctly blamed this on the U.S. I mean, he, he had no reservations about blaming this whole coup attempt on the U.S. Well, I'm sorry to, to jump in front of you here, but the, the one of the businessmen who was uh, allegedly involved with the terrorist group that, you know, staged this lives in Pennsylvania, where Biden is also yes. from. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So, but it's, it seems to me that, that this is not just your usual kind of creepy crawlies that walk in and out of all these administrations. It's like this weird group. And, and the interesting thing about it to me, too, is that they, they seem phenomenally incompetent. You know, the people running the Biden show, just they don't seem to know what they're doing. And that might be a function of you know, not being part of the mainstream of the party, but it also might be the fact that, you know, it's some sort of cult or sect that is so married to their own dogma and beliefs that they, they have shut out, you know, the, the influence of reality in the outside world. And that's kind of destroyed their ability to act effectively because I, in, in my life, I mean, I'm old, I'm 55 years old now. I'm a grandfather for Christ's sake, you know, I've seen it all, you know, and I got to say that this is the most bizarre, most surreal, most incompetent train wreck of, of an administration I've ever seen. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your party affiliation is. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you support this or not. It's just so phenomenally screwed up. And that's why it just, you know, it starts to make me think of a cult because cults live in their own bubble. You know, they live inside this, this own little bubble and they don't measure or test their beliefs against reality. I mean, that's, that's the definition of a cult, really. You know, mm. they, they cannot, their beliefs cannot withstand sort of the crucible of the real world. Right. And just the fact that, you know, all these people are so terrible at what they do just really makes me think that it's like some strange cult. And, and I start to think about cults like Nexium that weren't necessarily like religious cults as we would understand them, but like these strange sort of cults of personality. I mean, I think, you know, when all is said and done, and it, it might take a little while, but I, I, I definitely get this very <clears throat> strong sense that it's going to turn out that Biden is being handled by this cult and there's some kind of metaphysics there, you know, there's some sort of metaphysical thing there that, that starts to bring this whole situation into the, the world of sorcery, you know? You know, and this is entirely due to recent events with a, a friend, a uh, fellow researcher who I do a show with, his name's Michael Wan. Some recent events that I don't really think I should go into caused me to go back and relook at an interview with the higher side chats had Jay Parker on, right? You might be familiar with this interview, but he talks about this satanic cult that's operating in Arden, Delaware, and they mm. have connections to pre-Atlantean times through the Amalekite people of the Old Testament. And they talk about how 
There are somewhat maybe 40 million of these operating satanic cult members. And this is all, you know, Jay's research, not mine, but he talks about how there's 40 million uh, of these cult members and they're in places where, you know, they have enough pull, you know, where they can sort of run the means of the town. And if anything gets, you know, exposed, they can... You know, they have the right person, maybe let's say the coroner, they have the guy who brings the cases to the right judges. They can't get all the judges, but they have one or two judges, you know, in place. So they have this system. And when you're saying what you're saying, it's kind of making me feel like, you know, this cult is sort of at its ends. Like they've, they've kind of gone as far as they can at this point in time. And, and something's happening right now where people are either wising up through the pandemic but you know everything that came before that with the child trafficking stuff that was coming out it feels like there is maybe a loose connection there at least through delaware and then you know to bring biden back into it biden spends some time in his childhood in arden delaware where this satanic cult apparently according to jay parker had run of the whole town right so yeah you know, <laughs> how how is this how is satanic defined here i mean right well, I what think are their beliefs, I mean, see, one of the things I have a problem with is that when people use the word satanic and Satanist, it, it tends to be very flabby and loose, you know, yeah. it seems to be more of like an adjective rather than it is, you know, a proper descriptor, you know, Agreed. so, you know, if, if, you know, they're talking about the Malachites and so on. I mean, the Malachite, that's the, the root word of that is the Hebrew word for angel which is uh, very interesting. And another thing that's very interesting is that the a, a Greek version of the same word means temple prostitutes. So there's a, there's a very interesting overlap there. But I, I mean, here's the problem when, when, you, when you talk about Satanists. I mean, you've got people like um, Lucian Greaves and the Satanic Temple, and it's so clearly just a CIA cutout. It's just a joke. But, you know, wh what's... Where where is the satanic literature? Where's the, the historical satanic literature? You know, what what scripture are they they working from? I mean, where's the theology? Where's the cosmology? You know? Right. So when people start to talk about Satanists, it's like, well, do you mean like actual Satanists, like that kind of like Anton LaVey, Marilyn Manson, Lucian Greaves kind of Satanism? Or do you mean something else, you know, because well, a lot of people outside of, you know, people particularly like evangelical Christians or so on will describe, you know, anything that they see as outside their own sphere of influence is satanic. Right. But does that mean it's actually satanic? And, you know, the thing that I have a problem with is the psychology of it. And the Satanists themselves tend to be like just losers or just like rich perverts, you know, rich child monsters and so on. I mean, there really isn't, you know, I would never try to build an army of Satanists because they're all, <laughs> most of them are just losers and idiots, you know what I'm saying? Well, and so, I mean, what are the actual beliefs? I, I would really be curious to know what the actual theology is because that's a, that's a, a very important distinction because my feeling is, is that the kind of people who are drawn to say the, like this weird elite Mithraic cult that I've been talking about. I mean, they're the kind of people who aren't going to like choose, you know, the loser in somebody else's story as their God, you know, then they, right. they, they just, they, they don't think that way. And, and really, I mean, Satan, Satan himself is very poorly defined in the Bible. You know, I mean, you have Satan is like a, a member of the the divine council in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you've got like all these different manifestations that are ascribed to Satan. But does that mean an actual figure means named Satan, or is this some sort of egregore or talpa that represents, you know, the the black iron prison, you know, the empire? Mm. Well. And I agree with everything you said. I'm glad you, you pointed that all of that out because I don't think, you know, people use it in the proper terms. But in this case, I think they're only using that term. And this, again, could be debatable, but because of the association with SRA, the ritual abuse aspect of what Jay Parker underwent growing up in this cult-like family, whether or not 
they were truly following Satan as a maybe an apocalyptic Christian mindset might lead us to believe. I don't, you know, I don't think that's the case. I think it's somewhere in the middle. It's not black or white. It's it's more gray. But I think, you know, if we were to call these folks sorcerers, it'd still be true according to everything Jay talks about. They're doing things like, you know, working with light beings who then possess their bodies while they do in insanely dark things. It's not an episode I recommend unless you're really interested in researching this stuff. It wasn't an Well, I am now because when yeah. you so here's the interesting thing. You you mentioned Arden, Delaware, right? Right. And Rose and, Valley, um, Pennsylvania also connects to this. But but yeah, Biden did spend some time in Arden, Delaware, which is not mentioned in this episode, but I kind of pieced that together myself. Well, I'll, I, I need to look into this because, you know, that's my backyard. And also it kind of connects to some other loose ends that I've been trying to piece together. So I think I definitely need to have a look at that. Absolutely. Can we get into the loose ends a little bit, maybe for sake of uh, bringing more questions and answers, but still the questions Um, are why we're here. Yeah. I, 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 it's not something that I can articulate too well right now. It's, I That's need right. to sort of weigh it. I, I need to look at this information and see if there's any, you know, interesting evidence before I can start giving you opinions on that. Because sure. like I said, I mean, it just rung the bell. I, I need to, I need some yeah. time to let it stew in my head for a while. Well, let's shift gears a little bit back to, you know, the message to the mystics and maybe the sort of touch points that you're presenting as to why, you know, this weaponizing of magic is only one edge of the double-edged sword. Well, and those are my like words, said, not yours. So yeah, yeah, no, I know what you're saying, but I, I think it's sort of just, this is like one of my concerns about esoteric groups and so on. You know, I, I've sort of been, my, my thinking's really been evolving on this. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm very hesitant about esotericism is that it tends to encourage people to sort of split off into very atomized directions, you know? And when you're, you know, you start to reach, reach my age, you know, you have a bunch of people who, who can't even speak to each other. You know, they, they keep, they're so lost in whatever road they've taken, whatever path they've taken, that they can't, they can't connect to people anymore. And this is part of, you know, I'm I'm very concerned about people my age and older being alone and and dying alone and and just dropping out of, of the world. And I think that esotericism kind of encourages this. But also esoteric groups tend to encourage elitism and resentment and can lead to, you know, very dark places, you know. So when you think, okay, here we are, we understand this, the world doesn't understand this, the world doesn't appreciate this, therefore the world is wrong and we're right. And therefore these people are evil or, you know, below us somehow subhuman or whatever and we're the we're the initiated we're the enlightened ones and so let's start to do fucked up shit against other people because they deserve it because they don't know the truth you see what i'm getting at well, it's the same dynamic that Manly P. Hall talks about with those sorcerers in Egypt exactly. where they learned the secret knowledge and then they burned all the books so no one else could ever, you know, stand up to them at a, on equal ground. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing. I mean, that's, I think that's just a very human process. And I think there's this, you know, a very distinct and traceable psychology behind that, if you know what I'm saying. And again, but it's just this whole idea of elitism and the self-appointed elite and, you know, people controlling information, people weaponizing information. This is just human nature. It's gone on throughout history. 
And the danger of it in, in a society like ours is that that kind of thinking can be wedded to mass communications, instantaneous information, uh, instantaneous communications, social media, uh, you name it. You know, right. you, you can start to uh, supercharge something that's already weaponized. And I think that's so much of what we're seeing now. You know, I, I think that's so much what we're seeing now. But, you know, I, I think the one thing that, that Hall didn't go into, and if I was going to write sort of an amendment to that book, I would add is like this kind of thinking and, and these kinds of people, it always ends badly. You know, it always falls apart. There's a, there's a thinking in the conspiracy realm that just absolutely infuriates me. And it's like, oh, well, you know, these elites are superhuman and they have all the super science and they're one step ahead of us and they're playing, you know, eighth dimensional chess and, and we don't understand. And, you know, anytime they fuck up, it's because they meant to. And then you, know, you got to look at X and X and X that they're actually planning. You know, it's constantly moving goalposts because, you know, you need to sort of make almost like deities of, of these people. And it's just not like that. You know, the system is really the beast, you know, and the people within it serve the system, but the people who serve the system are also entirely disposable as we saw with Jeffrey Epstein and, and Ghislaine Maxwell and, and, you know, all this me too stuff and, you know, all the stuff that we've seen in the past few years, you know, you're never bigger than the, the system. And I think one of the reasons why they're rat fucking Harvey Weinstein so bad is I think he, because he pissed a lot of people off in Hollywood during his career, but also because he saw himself as bigger than the system. And those are the people that always get taken down. The people who see themselves as bigger than the system. Those are the people who need to be humiliated, taken down because the system itself is the beast. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I, this, this tendency that comes from a lot of really bad conspiracy material that was just has just been cut and pasted and cut and pasted thousands and thousands of times over, you know, for the past 30 or 35 years on you know, bulletin boards and then Usenet and then the World Wide Web. And it's like, I know where all this stuff comes from. And I know, you know, who the people who were sort of feeding this into the system are. And, you know, they're not people I have any respect for at all. You know, I mean, I still, for instance, see like Fritz Springmeier stuff cut and pasted over and over again. And it's just like, how many times does it, you know, his material need to be debunked? You know, I mean, it's like these, these old families that he was reading about, say, like in hundred year old conspiracy books, they, they just, some of them don't even exist anymore. You know, I mean, they died out. Or, you know, their wealth and their power was all sort of transferred into foundations or corporations. You know, it's just, there isn't this kind of superhuman hierarchy that, that too many conspiracy people think about. So when I talk about the source hierarchy, I'm not talking about like, you know, Lex Luthor and Brainiac and the Joker and, you know, the secret society of supervillains. I'm talking about like just really sleazy, unprincipled people who use metaphysical technology or abuse it, you know, to serve their own ends. But they're not, that doesn't make them anything other than just sleaze, you know, power hungry sleaze bags. And I, I think it's really important for us to not let this kind of reverse psychology psych us out, you know? Right. Well, it feels like it's kind of like an illusion cast to make us all feel so small when in reality, this hidden hand, if it even is in operation still, is very small uh, in nature. It, it would have to be, right? Because, you know, naturally, you know, these people are even fighting each other for the reins of power. So uh, the other thing too, yeah. yes, is the factionalism. The factionalism right. is another major part of it because these people are all megalomaniacs, you know, right. They're all egomaniacs and narcissists and sociopaths. So I, they're, they're naturally going to be constantly fighting against each other and trying to undo each other. And I think the interesting thing now is that, you know, this is another thing I keep talking about 
is that you had all these sort of 19th century ideas, or maybe even earlier, maybe going back to like someone like Francis Bacon, you know, all these sort of utopian dreams of a scientifically ordered society, you know, that we saw results in, in communism and, and, and really Nazism and fascism as well. I mean, they're all sort of working from the same playbook, even if they sort of go off in their own little directions. But these, these plans never work. And I think what the current class of sorcerer arc, arcs think or what they thought is that there's going to be super science that's going to come along and save the day for them. You know, everything's going to be okay. They can do whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. They can do whatever they want to whoever they want to, because, you know, their, their scientists are all working on all these miracles, these comic book miracles right. that are going to turn them into gods. It, it, um, it brings to mind this section that I highlighted to ask you about where Manly P. Hall says under the theory and practice of black magic, the fourth, I guess, rule or premise is that true black magic is performed with the aid of a demonical spirit who serves the sorcerer for the length of his length of his earthly life with the understanding that after death, the magician shall become the servant of his own demon. For this reason, a black magician will go to inconceivable ends to pro prolong his physical life since there is nothing for him beyond the grave. And that just brings to mind transhumanism and exactly what you're saying, this sort of mythical super science that they had crossed their fingers for. Yes. And, and I just read that Jeff Bezos has now taken up the, the cause of defeating death. Well, here's the problem. We've reached, we've reached the end of the age of scientific miracles. And this is something that I've just been banging on over and over again, is that the age of scientific progress is basically slow to a trickle, you know, you know, when you read about what's called the great stagnation, you know, part of the reasoning behind it is that all the low hanging fruit, so to speak, has been plucked, you know, all the things that were easy and obvious to conceive of and invent, you know, that's all been done. I mean, we have indoor plumbing and, you know, electricity and telephone and internet and motor cars and airplanes. And, you know, we have all this stuff now, but the problem is, is that we were sort of sold this mythology starting in the twenties and thirties, that this was just going to go on and on forever. That this, this rate of te technological improvement was just going to keep going on and, until we became like robot super gods or something. And really about Almost 20 years ago now, I mean, it, it just skidded to an absolute halt. And the problem is, is that a lot of people, you know, like your Bill Gates and your Klaus Schwab's and so on, they were all convinced by their, their, their flunkies that, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we're going to have all the super science for you and you're going to be immortal and, you know, you're going to be a space wizard and you'll travel to um, Mars and so on. And none of that's going to happen, or at least it's not going to happen in our lifetime. You know, if there is progress, it's going to be very halting and grinding. And the problem is, is that the whole idea of pro progressivism was wedded to this scientific progress, you know, this, this notion that, that science was going to just take, you know, take us to the stars and make us gods. You know, you, you, you hear that old idea back in the, I guess in the 2000s, like, you know, science flies us to, to the moon and religious, religion flies planes into to buildings and so on. You know, that kind of thinking, like it's just like religion and, and all that kind of stuff is, is old hat. And, you know, if you, the, the, the miracles that you expect from religion or, or whatever, or spirituality, you know, don't worry about them because, you know, you'll be able to buy them over the counter with this, with the super science. That's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And one of, another reason that I get really irritated with a lot of conspiracy people is that they buy into this stuff. You know, today I, on Twitter, I saw somebody was quoting this, you know, running this thread with all these, vid, you know, videos of some idiot from DARPA just going on and on about this and that. And it's like, I just feel like saying like, listen, I've been following DARPA since the eighties. It's like 99.9% .9 of the things that they've given press releases about that are just 
right around the corner and around the way have never materialized. And, and they're not going to. You know, we've reached the natural limit dictated by the physics, dictated by physics that we cannot get past. So the sorcerer arcs, you know, have this whole notion that, you know, like Manly P. Hall says, that, that they were going to create their own immortality and that was going to save them from, you know, whatever, you know, when the bill comes due for whatever's given them power for so long. So yeah, it's, it's, just, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And we really need to stop feeding into this whole mythology of super science and, you know, space travel and all this kind of stuff, because that just, that's just there to hook the normies along for the whole progressive agenda, you know? Right. Right. Now I wonder, you know, I had a conversation with a friend, Matt Raymer, who's, you know, behind content safe. He's a CEO and founder. He's been on the internet as long as computers have let you be on the internet. In other words, you know, he's an OG of the internet and something that he talked to me about when I was asking about technology. And I agree with the point you just made. And I was kind of expressing a similar point and, and he said something along the lines of, you know, we can't run away from technology. We have to embrace it. And one thing that I see happening, at least uh, from my perspective with the podcast, is that this element of synchro mysticism or synchronicity has weaved itself through my life, got me sort of into this world somehow. And now I see it happening with the listeners of the show where, you know, people reach out and say, oh, I was listening. And just as this was said, I looked up and it was right there, you know, just these weird uncanny moments that, you know, can kind of feel like uh, ubiquitous at times, but in other times, especially in cases like yours, where you're, you know, following threads and researching things, it feels like this element of synchro mysticism is like the magic inside of this technology that they could. Yeah. It's, play it's the for. ghost in the machine. It's mm -hmm. the ghost in the machine. See, the technology is not the problem. Right. Okay. Technology is neutral. Right. And technology, you know, you can, I always say that, you know, you can use a, an, an airplane to fly to California or you can use an airplane to drop bombs on like a school in Yemen, you know, right. or a hospital in, in Iraq or something. I mean, it's just like how you choose to employ the technology is the idea. So the, the technology itself is not the problem. The problem with the technology is how evil people use it. You know, that it's given evil people the opportunity to weaponize this technology against other people. But the thing is, is that that never goes on forever, you know? And like I said, this current class of sorcerer arcs automatically assume that it was going to go on forever. And it's not, you know, it's just, it just simply is not, it's just not going to happen. So that's something that we're going to need to deal with. But, you know, like I said, being the joker in the pack, the, the ghost in the machine, I, I think that's a really good role for people to play, you know, it's, you're going to humanize the machine. You are going to subvert the, the mechanistic thinking. You're going to subvert the reductionism. You're going to subvert the progressivism with, with humanity, you know, and, and spirit and nature, you know, all those good things. We, we, you know, we're going to use this technology to bring those back into the world, you know, and, and sort of undermine the, you know, the control grid. Right. But here's the thing, I mean, the control grid always falls. You know, that's, it's something that I think is really hard for a lot of people to understand because, you know, you sort of grow up with like certain people in charge and so on. Well, but, you know, one of the things I say is like in the, in the okay, in the 18th century, right, the power in, you know, the, the colonies of America was with the landowners, right? The people who owned the plantations and so on. That's where all the, those were the people who had the power. And then in the 19th century, it was the industrialists, you know, it was the people building the factory, you know, drilling for gas and so on. And, you know, the people who were the captains of industry, but they also gave way in the 20th century 
to the the technocrats, you know, the people who used, you know, mass communications and banking and and all these other kind of things to cement their own power. But their hundred years is up. It's 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 coming to an end. And I think a lot of the problems that we see in this country right now are due to the fact that the people who, who whose power is is waning understand that. You know, they they understand that. And like here's a great example. Like Hollywood is is basically I, I was just reading in Variety that the, you know they said they're having a fire sale. I mean, they're selling off all their assets, they're gonna be selling off everything but the you know, the chairs, you know, the 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 furniture or whatever the the furnishings because Hollywood's been running at a deficit for a very very long time and the only thing that was really saving them you know besides laundered drug money was was China and China just said you know fuck you Hollywood we're not we're not putting any of your movies out anymore and the entire industry is in crisis panic mode you know that's why we saw like the golden globes weren't even televised, right? I mean, they weren't even streamed. It's over. It's shutting down. Hollywood is shutting down. Big tech is next. Big tech is starting to, big tech was floated by all this venture capital and, and you know, tax write-offs and money laundering, you know, all the money sort of flowed into there. And, you know, the money is always fake. It's always inflated. But that's start. you know, that's in crisis mode now. So all the technocrats, power is being challenged, you know, by the rise of China and the rise of India. So we have these, these new powers, these new superpowers that are going to displace the source hierarchy. They're going to displace the technocrats. And that's why, you know, we have situations where, you know, this, this crazy old man and this cult of advisors that he has around him are talking seriously about launching a, a ground war against Russia in the wintertime. You know, because when has that not worked out, right? You know, when has that not failed spectacularly? Wow. So, I mean, it's a very interesting time that we're in because, like I said, this, the current ruling class that really rose to power in, in the late teens, you know, with the passage of like the Federal Reserve Act and so on. And in the 20s, with the rise of mass communications, you know, we started to see radio and motion pictures, phonograph records, you know, all these forms of mass communication that were very powerful and were used very effectively by, you know, the ruling class of, of technocrats, right? But that's on the wing too, because, you know, now we have 10 million podcasts and 10 million TV channels and streaming and all this kind of stuff. So we're at a very interesting time because, you know, these sorcerer arcs that, that seem to embed themselves into every, you know, ruling class structure are panicking. I mean, they're really panicking because they know that the, 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 the free ride is coming to an end. And this is something that Manly P. Hall didn't really have perspective on. He couldn't have really commented on this stuff because it, it wasn't really happening. I mean, he was really writing at the the time of the rise of the technocrats, you know, exactly like I said, that early 20s period, right? And he couldn't really understand how quickly their reign would be over. And it's coming to an end now. And, you know, a lot of it is this challenge by, you know, Russia and China and India that um, the West really is not going to have an answer to, you know, because you're talking, I mean, that's almost... You know, that's upwards of three and a half billion people there. You know, I mean, that's almost half the world's population that are saying, you know, fuck you. We're tired of you. We're tired of your bullshit. We're going our own way. And how does, you know, the, the, the source hierarchy that always, like I said, it's almost like this parasitical organism that always embeds itself in, in, in ruling classes and in palaces and all this kind of stuff. I mean, how are they going to, how are they going to cope with that? You know, I, I think it's going to get very weird and, and very ugly and very challenging. But the opportunity, you know, it's like crisis opportunity. The opportunity for, for people like us, you know, who want humanity, who want nature, who want, you know, a spirit of cooperation, who want 
you know, happiness is life's goal rather than acquisition. You know, all these kind of things, these more humanistic, you know, more loving, more compassionate kind of ideas and so on. You know, we can use these tools now to achieve our own goals. And for me, synchromysticism is so important is because unlike all the, you know, what I call the other forms of, it's something that you can really catalog. It's something that you can really like, here are the, here are the correspondences, here are the coincidences, you know, here it all is, you know, it's, it's, it's all there. It's like when I did that and I did that huge post on the Elizabeth Fraser stuff, it's like, I, it's like the size of a book and, and, and who can get to the end of that article and say, oh, I, I think, you know, I think this Chris Knowles guy is full of shit. You know, it's nobody can say that now because the, the, the evidence is so overwhelming. And that to me is the beauty of synchronisticism is that it really is an evidence-based form of, I don't know, divination, whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's not so much an art form, you know, even though it definitely is an art form as it is kind of like, uh, you know, it's a methodology, you know? Well, and I think it's inextricably a part of this world of mass communication that, as you said, developed, mm -hmm. you know, way after Manly P. Hall could have predicted anything, even though, you know, you can read into some of what he's saying and see how there was that synchronicity of life just operating through different means, maybe in his time. But I even see it with the, the books. I mean, for example, I was going back into your Patreon archives, right? You post a lot of different interviews. Some go back, I don't know how many years ago this one was. And you mentioned a book called 50 Greatest Conspiracies of All Time. And it's, mm. you know, full of these stories that, you know, I don't know those two authors well enough to say that they were seeing things through a synchromistic lens themselves, if they would say that in their own words, but you can certainly read into that. And, you know, the internet wasn't nearly what it is today when they were writing it. Yeah, that's uh, one of those guys, or well, the main guy is Jonathan Banken. So so that book is a really interesting book because it's, it's basically a document of, you know, the pre-internet period when you sort of really had to do the work to find all this material. Right. Because a lot of this material was, you know, was, Xerox or was on shortwave radio or was on bulletin boards or was, you know, in, in obscure books that you could only get through mail order and all this kind of stuff. So I, I have a mad respect for, for those guys and, and Jonathan Bank and whoever else he was working with, because it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get all this stuff together. You know, it isn't like it is today where you can just do a few searches and, and get whatever you need to know. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I got that book when it was the 60 <laughs> greatest conspiracies of all time. And if you ever watched the episode of uh, the X-Files called Anasazi, you know, the, this hacker who's trying to get into the defense department's mainframe. And, you know, while his program is sort of running, he's, you know, highlighting <laughs> passages in that book. You know, so that really shows where that culture really emerged from, you know, that it emerged from this kind of post-hippie, nerd, techie kind of culture, you know, hackers and so on, you know, very anti-authoritarian, strong libertarian instincts. If you, you know, if you're familiar with the, uh, the X-Files, you know, like the lone gunman, I mean, I, I just freaked out when I first saw the lone gunman because it's like, I know guys like that, you know, <laughs> those are like guys I know that it's like, it was so perfect. It was the way they were cast and the way they behaved and the things they talked about. And, but there was actually another character on that same show before them called uh, Max Fennig, who's sort of like the prototype to that. And and that was another, just, I couldn't believe that because it was like, oh my God, you know, this is a guy I've run into, you know, <laughs> and all these kind of things. Because I was really interested in all that stuff back in the early 90s, like cyberpunk and, you know, the hacking kind of sphere and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But so that book is really interesting because, you know, you really, he put the sweat equity into it and you've got to respect that. And, Again, I mean, a lot of that stuff may not hold up to scrutiny today, but a lot of it does. And, you know, we have to understand 
you, you have to understand. A lot of times I just, I hate when people use the terms like conspiracy or conspiracy theory. I really prefer the term like corruption theory. Because really when you get down to it is that conspiracy is, it's a, it's a mechanism within a corrupt system, you know, and corruption is really the, the, the sole focus for me is like, you know, class politics, class privilege and, and, and power structures and, and how corruption just sort of becomes like the mortar that, that glues all these bricks together. So I, I think that, I think the conspiracy is really against the people who figure out the corruption, right? You, when you start expressing all these things, people form a conspiracy against you, it seems, right? They're like, hey, what are you, why are you rocking the boat? Don't you realize what this could do? <laughs> well, the interesting thing, too, is, I mean, look what they, they've been doing to Alex Jones, right? Mm. And, you know, they've, they've really tried to make an example of him. Right. And I mean, I'm not a big Alex Jones fan, but you know, I, I really do kind of admire his audacity, you know, because he's uh, other people when sort of faced with this onslaught of like, you know, lawfare and censorship and just all the hassles that he's had to face would fold, you know, they would just sort of naturally fold. And he's just, you know, he's got this obstinate part of his personality that that sort of precludes him from giving into that you know and you know david ike is another one and it's interesting too because you know one of another thing that drives me crazy about the conspiracy realm is like oh you know everybody's a, a shill everybody's a spy everybody's a plant and everything like that and it's like yeah well you know i think after 20 or 30 years you know somebody like a david ike or a Mark Dice or an Alex Jones, whether you agree with them or follow them or not, you know, it's like, I think they've been vetted. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think they've like sort of withstood the test of time. So I think that, you know, this whole notion that, you know, just, I just see so often, it's always from like beginners and amateurs, you know, you know, I find very, very annoying. And I second that. Right. But, you know, getting back to that, that book, right. I mean, that's really, it's, 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 it almost seems to be like, it's like a relic of a bygone age. And I got to tell you something, boy, I miss, I miss the nineties like crazy. For some reason I don't miss the eighties. <laughs> like, I don't even remember the eighties half the time, but you know, I really do miss the nineties and, uh, I really miss that culture. I really miss that sort of, you know, hacker, nerd, computer, cyberpunk, conspiracy sort of realm. That's, you know, it's kind of where I made my bones. It's what I cut my teeth on and I miss it like crazy. And, you know, it was a lot of fun and it was really interesting. And I think that we're at a point now where everyone is a conspiracy theorist, no matter what side of the spectrum you fall on, but you don't recognize yourself as such and you accuse you know, other people of being such, you know what I mean? So it's like people, you know, neoliberal types buy into the whole like Russia gate, Rachel Maddow, all, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. And then they have their own, you know, alternative set of facts and so on. And then they can, you know, they freak out against people like Alex Jones because he's a conspiracy theorist. It's just all like, you know, what's Keith Olbermann? What's Rachel Maddow? You know, what's MSNBC? What's CNN? It's all conspiracy theory all the time. It's just that, you know, my conspiracy theory is the truth and your conspiracy theory is uh, insurrection and subversion, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, given the whole January 6th, Thing, year echo of it with the anniversary. Well, I'm, I'm sure you read my uh, take on that whole situation. Right. Yeah. If people want to read it, just go back and read it. I, I don't really, I, I, I don't subscribe to any of the uh, official narratives, you know, whatever side they come from on that. I think that was, that was a nice little stage show that was produced by the sorcerarchy. Mm. You know, that was to me, you know, all the things that I look for, all the red flags were all there in, in abundance. And to me, that was just, you know, just one big giant ritual. And, you know, every ritual needs uh, dupes. 
and patsies, you know, they, you know, they, it needs fall guys, it needs sacrificial lambs, right? It needs right. scapegoats, right? So that's, that's kind of what we had. I, I, I'm very, yeah, I, I, I don't think anybody, most people aren't going to actually agree with me because they're so wedded to the politics and the emotion of it. But, you know, since I'm, I don't really buy into any of the politics, when I step back and I kind of look and it's like, oh yeah, well, there's that very specific and elaborate set of symbols all clustered together like they were 2000 years ago when they did shit like this. So right. there you go, whatever, you know? Right. Ceremonial magic happening, just taking on the clothes of the new era that it's being performed in. You know, it's, it's interesting though. You know, I, I appreciate you sharing the, the opinion and perspective you have on conspiracy theory. Cause as you said, you have major bones in this for a while and through that perspective that you have it's it's extremely unique but you know i wonder you know what there is to be said about folks like myself possibly or even folks listening who are seeing this synchro mysticism like weaving into their life and wondering like well what does this mean for me does this mean i have to you know go and do research too does this mean that you know i need to quit my job like i feel like there's a sort of momentum happening that people are picking up on and and when you get that fear out of the way it can be something that really connects you with maybe a higher force but then i'm reminded of what manly p hall says about how this you know sorcery of the past just got repackaged into the sort of you know new age new thought type movement that happened around that time as well mm -hmm. right right yeah no absolutely well here's the thing if you start to see this stuff enter into your life you know pay attention to it if nothing else it's going to offer you a new tool to work with you know what I mean? You have to be careful though, because like when you start to get into synchronicity, it's a force. It, it's, it's a sentient force. It's a force that plays with you. It's a force that interacts with you. You know, I have a certain set of, of rules and so on that I follow because I understand how easy it is to kind of go wrong with this stuff. And, you know, one of the things that I say is like, you know, be very, very rigorous, you know, be very, very strict and methodical about working with synchronicity and be very, very careful because it's going to, it's going to play with you. It's going to play with you. It's going to throw things at you and you're going to be like, how the hell is this happening? You know, like, where is this coming from? Like, why is this happening to me? And, you know, the answer is it's happening to you because it happens to everybody that interacts with it. You know, it, it, it enjoys it. It's, it's got sort of a, a trickster element to it. What I would recommend is you learn to work with it, but you use it as like, you know, it's not the cake, it's the frosting. Okay. You know, you, you want to bake the cake and the synchronicity is sort of the, the layer on top of it. It's kind of like, when I talk about like magical thinking, there are two basic kinds of magical thinking. It's like, well, I am just going to submit myself and to the study of magic and that's going to solve all my problems and, and allow me to prosper and so on in life. And boy, that always goes really badly. <laughs> Let me tell you that right now. That's a bad, that's a bad decision to make. But if you say, well, I'm going to do what I'm doing, I'm going to do what I'm doing, but I'm going to incorporate, you know, something like synchronicity as part of my toolkit, then that's, that's, that's what you want to go with. You know, it's just like, you want to use that. That's kind of like your secret weapon. You know what I mean? And, and again, it's, it's, it's also like the frosting on the cake. It's the, you know, it's the whipped cream on the Sunday. It's, it's sort of the, you know, X factor, the je ne sais quoi that kind of separates mediocrity from excellence. You know what I mean? It's just, but you don't want to, don't want to get sucked up into it and be very, very careful 
like I said, when it starts to play with you and it starts to throw all these things at you, because it's, you know, in my estimation, and this is going to sound maybe all delusional to people, but, you know, I think it's testing you. You know, I think the sync, you know, whatever force is behind the synchronicity is going to test you. And like I said, it's going to throw things at you that confuse you and sort of give you sort of an inflated sense of self and, and all this kind of stuff. But if you just realize, okay, well, this is this the way it works and it's testing me, then I think you'll be okay. You know what I mean? So if you use this as, like I said, as an augmentation to the work that you're already doing, that's the ideal. You know? Right. Right. And, you know, your work and your talks on the muse comes to mind when you say that I almost feel like maybe there's a, a stronger aspect of synchronicity in, in cases where, you know, artists are in touch with what they call a muse, you know, and maybe they are connecting with an entity that operates with this kind of synchronicity as one of the forces that it plays with. But, you know, I wonder how much precognition comes into play with this, because you have uh, a precognitive experience that you talk about here on the Secret Sun Institute Patreon may be an example worth bringing up. What do you think? Shoot. So you say somewhere around the same time frame you had this X Files dream, right? We were just talking mm. about that. That was filled mm -hmm. with precognitive emanations. And I'm wondering, you know, how much of this synchro mystic energy that people begin to play with is precognitive? Is it inherently pre? precognitive is all of it precognitive because i see sometimes people might just get caught up in like the analysis of like oh symbolisms and this is what this means and i saw this symbol today so that means this well that's you know i'm glad you brought that up so synchronicity i i, I tend to classify it and i think that when you're dealing with very potent symbolic systems or symbolic narratives, you know, the sinks are going to be stronger. They're going to be more potent. They're going to be more direct. Whether or not, you know, we're talking about precognition, you know, that's, that's sort of a factor of like, you know, when you talk about dreams or you said, oh, you know, I was just thinking about this and, and, it, and then it just happened, you know. I tend to be very wary of that stuff, not because I don't think it's true, but it's just, it's very hard to prove. You know what I mean? It's very hard to demonstrate. It's very hard to catalog. And I think that's where you start to run into trouble. So I, I think, you know, when you talk about precognition, it's like, it's just something else that I just fold into synchronicity. You know, it's like synchronicity is my focus because synchronicity is a phenomenon. You know, I'm not, I don't know exactly what's behind it. I don't know if it's precognition. I don't know if it's this. I don't know if it's that. I mean, I know precognition is part of it. You know, precognition plays into it. But to me, it's like my focus is the sync. You know, my focus is the synchronicity. And everything else to me is secondary to that. Everything else is sort of reliant on that. You know what I'm saying? So I that's how I was able to sort of work past that. You know. So again, I mean, I did have that very powerful, you know, that dream that's that did sort of, I don't know if you necessarily want to say that it, it came true, but you know, certain like central elements of it in a very interesting combination sort of showed up, you know, several years later. And those emanations were attached to extremely potent symbolic narratives and, and places and, and numerology and, you know, the name game, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, if you just fold all that stuff into synchronicity, I, I, I don't want to say it's safer, but I think it just, it gives you a more, what's the word I'm even thinking of? It's, it's, it's just easier to process in that way because you don't end up getting caught out on branches, you know, like, again, like the whole precognitive pre -cognitive thing or the magic thing or, you know, you name it. And like I said, synchronicity is going to play with you. It's going to test you. Right. And you need, you really need to be very, you know, what it reminds me, remember that in, in the empire strikes back, you know, uh, and Luke's on Dagobah, 
And then he ends up in the cave and this, you know, Darth Vader and he cuts his head off and it's him. You know, it's like, that was his test, you know, and he failed that test. Right. And, you know, synchronicity is going to do that to you. And I, I'm using synchronicity as a shorthand. I'm not exactly sure if synchronicity is just the phenomenon or the motor behind it. I don't know, you know, and I don't question that anymore because it's really irrelevant to my purposes. You know, I, I, what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to work with it and see where it takes me. And, and I'll see where it takes me with all these sort of questions that I've been working on for a longer time than I've been working with synchronicity. So again, it's just like, be very careful and be very rigorous and don't let yourself, you know, don't get carried away with yourself. So when you do have things like precognition and precognitive dreams like that, you know, just understand that that's part of the process, you know, it's, it's the way it works and, you know, it's fun and it's interesting and it's going to help change the way you experience the world. Right. So don't try to impose, you know, a more, let me just say like a kind of expectation. Don't, don't try to inflate these things with, with expectations and so on and so forth, because a lot of times it's just part of the game, you know? Right. Right. And it is a game. It is. A, I mean, it is a game, right? I mean, that's the, that's the thing about it. It's a, it's not a game like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Monopoly is a game. It's sort of like a game, like game theory. You know what I mean? It's sort of like a game, like a war game, or it's sort of like a game, like a, you know, or like a strategy game or something. It's, it's something much broader and, and more encompassing than just playing asteroids or, something, you know what I mean? or Pac-Man or whatever. It's something that is more far reaching than that. But there is a game to it. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's fun. It, it, there is a lot of fun to be had pursuing this kind of thing. And not only is there fun to be had, but at the end of it, it really does start to change the way you perceive reality and you experience reality. Right, right. And you mentioned that all form of human communication is symbolic from body language to verbal communication to written communication, you know, all of these different ways that we communicate with each other. And, you know, like I mentioned before, this book, another book that was recommended through a podcast and through a friend, Michael Wan, again, who says, hello, he's enough a fan of your work as am I, but this book, Secret Societies and Psychological Warfare by Michael Hoffman. And, mm -hmm. you know, page seven, he talks about the really, you know, the darkness that was America pre-internet. You know, we talked about how Jonathan Vankin kind of existed in that space. And Michael Hoffman did too. This book was printed, I think, in the same year. But he says, the occult cryptocracy processes the group mind of the masses mainly through psychodrama. The alchemical mm. and Rosicrucian command dogmas were literary works in course of receiving the establishment's reports and accounts of Jack the Ripper, the Hillside Strangler, Son of Sam, and the Unabomber. A mental virus is implanted in many precipitants. The hypodermic needle in this case is nothing more startling than a campfire story. Only the campfire is the crackling electrical current of a television, and the story is of our extinction. The narrative, the plot, the characters, and the symbolism all constitutes the imprinting that is one of the highest functions of ceremonial serial murder, right? And this is kind of why I brought that up and why I thought you might have some things to add because, you know, a lot of what you examine in your Secret Sun blog is this ceremonial process it might not always involve things as dark as murder but in the case of like you know these grand shows that they put on at events like the you know super bowl which is coming up soon right and and others which you know mm. globe golden globes was mentioned they seem to be out of the picture now but these ceremonies you know these serial events happen over and over and you know michael hoffman has a very dark kind of synchro mystic way of piecing this information together, but you know, no matter how you look at it, there is some sort of sorcery at play. Right. Hey, well, see, this goes back forever. 
it's only in the past, I don't know, 100, 150 years where we didn't see ritual and ceremony as being like an integral part of statecraft, an integral part of just life itself. And we didn't, you know, 150 years ago, we didn't have sort of these mass sporting events or these award shows or, you know, these mass communications that have, give, you know, that gave, you know, a much wider net to cast for a lot of these kind of symbolisms. But, you know, when you look at, I mean, all religion, the mystery religions, particularly, it, it all hinges on psychodrama, you know, ritual drama, because drama, in a lot of ways, it's, you know, it's clearly an expression of the human experience, but it's also a very highly effective way to implant a large number of symbols into a, a relatively contained space. You know, I mean, I, I think that music is, is, is much more effective at that. And, and music, you know, obviously can incorporate narrative and so on like that. You know, with Hoffman, one of the things that are always frustrating me with that, that whole old school type of proto-synchro mysticism, you know, Hoffman and Grimstad and, and Downard and so on, you know, aside from, you know, the politics, but it, a lot of it is like, I, one thing that drove me crazy when I, fought, you know, because I read excerpts of King Kill 33 in, you know, in Vankin's book. And then when I actually read King Kill 33, it's like I realized that, you know, Vankin had just sort of cherry picked all the good stuff and incorporated into his own text. And then when you read the actual text itself, it's like, oh, come on. You know, it's just like everything is just so approximate and, and, tries way too hard to fit too much into too little and it, it defeats its own premise you know in a lot of ways i think because you know this is another thing that i noticed with my synchromysticism work is that when i post something you know some sort of synchromystical study or whatever i don't think people really understand how much i leave out Okay, how much goes on the cutting room floor? And when I first started doing this, I would call these guppies. You know, I would just say, oh, all right, well, that's interesting, but it's a guppy, throw it back, you know? Because if you start to pile on a lot of weak evidence on top of strong evidence, it tends to, to really change the complexion of the work. And even a little bit of weak evidence can cancel out strong evidence. You know, you've got to be very careful. And when I read... King Kill 33 after hearing about it, you know, I was like, oh, this is terrible. This is really weak. You know, there are a few really good points that any, you know, anybody who looked at this would start to notice. But, you know, it's like he just grabs everything from everywhere. And it, and this is what I talk about when I say with your, your own synchronistic work is narrow your focus. You know, you're going to get a lot of guppies. You're going to get a lot of like false positives. If you're like, oh, well, you know, this is this and this is that. And, you know, I, this is this and, you know, Greek mystery religions. And this is this and, you know, the ancient Vedas. And this is this and Shintoism. And this is this and, I don't know, Aztec religion. You know, you just start doing what like Kenneth Grant does. You know, if you've ever read any of Kenneth Grant's books where it's just like, he's just taking everything from everywhere because he knows that if you look hard enough, and you cast your, your net wide enough, you're going to find something somewhere. But all it does is just make, you know, you look silly and weak and desperate. And that's really when, when I read a lot of that stuff. You know, for instance, when I finally read The Return of Pan after hearing about it for so long, I was just like, ah, this is, I'm not impressed by this at all. This is, this is really rather weak. You know, and maybe it's just the passage of time and so on. And a lot, you know, like... These guys were, you know, clearly working pre-internet days, but I just feel like there's just the lack of rigor in in a Hoffman or a um, a Downer or a Grimstad is is just it's kind of almost like a deal breaker for me because it just really starts to look weak. You know, for instance, when, when you know you said that Hoffman had cited the the Unabomber. I mean, you know, the Unabomber wasn't part of any of that stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe like the press used 
Ed is, is a scare story, but, you know, Ted Kaczynski was very clearly diametrically opposed to everything that, you know, that Hoffman claims that he was part of. He wasn't, you know what I mean? Right. And that's another thing that, you know, like I said, that drives me crazy about a lot of sort of immature or sophomore conspiracy stuff is just kind of assuming that everything is everything's part of the great plan and everybody's part of the plan and fourth dimensional chess. And, and every time these people fuck up or can't anticipate something they actually did, you know, because it's all just part of this whole grand scheme. And it just really starts to, you know, it's embarrassing. It just starts to feel very weak and desperate and sad. And, you know, like I said, I mean, if you've read the, you know, Ted Kaczynski's Unabomber manifesto, you get the print and you realize pretty quickly that, you know, he doesn't have anything to do with any of that stuff. You know, I mean, he was something that they couldn't anticipate. He was like, you know, an X factor, a wild card that she couldn't, you know, the, the system could not anticipate, you know, it couldn't plan for. And a lot of what we're seeing now with all the data mining and so on is is really a way to to anticipate those kind of things. It's really a way to try to anticipate the problems or anticipate the, the the wild cards or the black swans or the jokers in the pack, you know, however you choose to define it, but it, it's not going to work because I don't think computers can really understand that. You know, AI, first of all, is, is just, it doesn't actually exist. You know, it's, it's, it's really a myth because a good chunk of the work that you'll see credited to AIs is really being done by humans in conjunction with algorithms. So it's not, it's not AI as it's solved. So I, I think that you've got to be, you know, be very careful with this kind of stuff. Because like I said, they can't anticipate everything. And I think their ability to anticipate everything paradoxically is going to decrease, is going to get weaker as the technology gets stronger because they just, you know, they just become more and more reliant on it and lazier. And more complacent, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of reminds me of what you were speaking to somebody about, I think it was Giger. I was listening to an interview and you're talking about HR Giger and that like spaceman suit and how the, the creature inside of the space suit, he was like, you know, he couldn't look away from his console. You know, he was like so glued into the technology that when he died, he, you know, and that served as a really interesting metaphor that, you know, you eventually become, you know, stuck to the machine almost the same way the black magician dooms himself by selling his soul away to these demons. You know, it's you, you, you sell your soul, so to speak. Yes. And I think that's something that the technology just empowered, you know, and accelerated. Right. You know, so I've, I've done, I don't know if you've read the Lucifer's Technologies series, but I sort of laid out how, you know, the microchip and the, you know, the computer process, the microprocessor and the transistor and, and all these, you know, these modern marvels that Rio you know, our entire existence to these days really came about in a very strange way and, and followed a hot on the heels of some very elaborate rituals, you know, mass rituals, some very elaborate mass rituals with very specific symbolism and so on. And then at the end of this whole process, you know, lo and behold is this miracle device, the transistor that, you know, eventually comes to, you know, revolutionize human communication and so on. But like I said, I mean, there is, you know, it's almost like there's a, it reminds me of Alistair Crowley was said to have inserted like booby traps into all his rituals and whatever, <laughs> you know, you're like the whole thing about like creating a homunculus and so on, you know, that there was this whole school of thinking that, that Crowley had always inserted these traps into his spells and his rituals and all the rest of it. And, you know, some people believe that, you know, Jack Parsons, for instance, was trying to create a homunculus when he, he blew himself up mm. in 1952. Like a kill uh, you know, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, cause like, 
I think that, you know, this is so much kind of a lot of hysteria about Crowley, but really what it just boils down to me about Crowley and, and why I have a problem with him, you know, whatever he might've written that might seem enlightened and wise and so on, is that he was just an asshole and he treated people like shit. You know what I mean? And to me, it's like, that's fruit of the poison tree. If, if you're trying to take anything from somebody who is so clearly abusive and domineering towards other people, you know, you, you can't, you can't separate the magical work, you know, again, which is a very human thing. It's a, you know, it's an expression of humanity and, and nature from somebody who's just basically a douchebag, you know, and just isn't a, a nice person and, and tended to destroy a lot of the people who trusted him the most. So again, I mean, I, that's sort of like ties back to when I talk about where you've got to be very careful and balanced about how you approach any sort of metaphysics or supernatural or paranormal kind of pursuits, because there are traps built into it. And, you know, this is something that I discovered about tarot because I was sort of messing around with tarot and I was getting like really kind of shockingly, <laughs> shockingly specific and pointed results. And then I started to, I, I'm not exactly, I can't even explain exactly how it was, but I just came to see like the whole mechanism behind it is, is at best sort of like a malicious trickster. You know, that I saw, it was like an imp, like to me, like whatever is driving the tarot, I don't know what's the tarot itself, or maybe some aspect of our psyches or whatever is driving it, that, that I think that it has a very sort of malicious imp trickster type of aspect to it that, you know, you need to be very, very careful of, you know? I mean, I'm not going to go out and say, oh, it's demons, you know, in, <laughs> demons possess tarot decks or whatever. But I, I do think that there is, you know, there's a very strong element of, of malice behind it. And I think that, you know, maybe most people will never experience that, but maybe they do and they don't realize it. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say, but there is something that I don't like about it. And, and a lot of things that I was sort of, you know, fascinated by, like, I remember when I, when I, so like my wife and I stood on our front porch and just like stared at this chevron shaped UFO hovering over the trees. You know, it was very bright and we, it was the middle of the night and we're just staring at this thing and it starts doing these weird sort of lateral motions. And it looked exactly like, you know, the, the chevron UFOs that the people have put YouTube videos up and, you know, maybe it's some sort of technology. I don't know, but I just remember like sitting there thinking like, I, I don't like that thing. You know, this just, it, it, it exudes an energy that I'm just not comfortable with. You know, I'm not saying that it was evil or satanic or whatever. I just like, I don't like it. I don't like what it does. You know, I don't like that it's there. I don't like that. I don't like that I, it doesn't make itself known, that it doesn't announce itself to us. It's, just, it's just something that I don't trust about it. And, and oddly enough, my son had, you know, a very remarkably similar experience uh, a couple of years before that, you know, he and his friends had seen these UFOs hovering over the golf course that they're working at. And, you know, he'd taken video of it, uh, you know, it's not very good video because it was, you know, he had an older phone at the time, but you know, it's, it's pretty clear what you're looking at, even if it's not very high res. And, you know, he went out and bought like this expensive telephoto camera and so on, you know, because he, you know, he was just sort of caught up in the excitement of it. And then he just like, a couple of weeks later, he didn't want to talk about it. Like he, he, he didn't want to, you know, it just, it, again, it, it just had this like effect on him. That's just like, I'm not really comfortable with that thing. You know, I'm not going to say that it's, uh, you know, demons, uh, demon chariots from hell or whatever, but I just don't like it. You know, I'm not comfortable with it. It doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> you know what I mean? and, and I think that so much of like the paranormal that people kind of pursue in that fashion, it's almost like be careful what you wish for because it, it, it may show up and it may not be what you thought it was. And, you know, it may not go the way you thought it would basically. So, yeah, I uh, mean, any, any kind, any kind of supernatural. So it's like, even like when I was saying before about synchronicity, it's like you got to be very careful with it because it's going to play with you. It's going to test you. Right. You know what I mean? And you've right. got to be, you've got to be very, rigorous and centered about it 
because a lot of people can kind of, you know, go off the deep end with it. And truth be told, I did for a few years, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just so overwhelming to me. And it was just was so mind blowing to me that it, it kind of like, I don't know, it just messed my head up for a while. And I was able, you know, to develop these kind of methodologies, these, you know, these steps, so to speak, that gave me a much more centered and focused approach to this kind of stuff, you know, and I, it wasn't like, you know, it's like building a, a good, strong raft to withstand, you know, a storm, basically. Right. Yeah, we've had uh, a past guest on the show express a very same or similar feeling to having a, a similar sighting out in uh, Hawaii. He was on an island, saw some some lights off in the distance and just had this real, real uncomfortable feeling. And I myself, you know, I've had some strange experiences just owning this Alistair Crowley book. I might have talked to you about it the first time you were here, but yeah, I brought it to work with me one day and, you know, this guy comes in, seemingly homeless and he's writing, you know, scribbling in between the the pages of the lines in the pages of a Bible. He's got like plastic candles. And I'm like, what are the odds that the only day I bring this Aleister Crowley book into work to read, you know, in my offhand, like when I had a little break, this guy is just, you know, conducting his own somewhat of a, a ritual <laughs> in public view at the cafe. I don't know, just odd things like that gave me a sense of, of caution about the whole affair. Well, that's, that's wisdom and that's also experience. Right. You know, it's like, one of the things I say is that, you know, all this stuff is real, okay, to, to, to one extent or the other. It just doesn't work like you think it does or the way they show you in movies or the way, I don't know, some of the literature might lead you to believe. It, it works differently and it's much more subtle because it is, at the core of it, you know, we're talking about supernatural phenomena. We're talking about the spirit realm. And, you know, we're talking about forces, okay? And people accept that, you know, there's cosmic rays and ultraviolet rays and radio waves of all, you know, across this huge frequency and, you know, light, you know, the, the ultra, you know, the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, people accept that there are all these kind of things that they can't see. And they, a lot of times they, you know, can't actually be measured, you know, you can only sort of like use them, you know, set up sort of machines or whatever to, to kind of make use of them, but you still don't really understand them. You know, you just still don't really understand where they come from or how they work, you know, like for instance, lightning. It, it, one thing, if you told most people that scientists really have no idea how lightning actually works or what causes it, where it comes from. They would say that you're crazy. It's like, oh, you, that, that's not true. No, it is true. <laughs> you know, scientists really don't understand how lightning works or where it comes from or causes. They don't, you know, there are a lot of theories that people subscribe to, but they're just theories. And it's like the same thing. It's like with psychology and psychiatry. You know, I, I had a psychiatrist tell me, he said, you know, the truth is, is that we really don't understand how the mind works. And we have these medications that we use that control symptoms, okay? You know, that, you know, for instance, when people are schizophrenic or bipolar, they take medications that kind of regulate, you know, serotonin and, and dopamine and so on. You know, it just regulates the production of these chemicals in the brain to, you know, kind of even them out and just make them a little more functional. But the fact is, is that Science doesn't actually understand what's behind this. You know, they, they have theories, right? And they have certain methodologies to treat certain symptoms, but they don't know. You know, we don't, we don't understand what consciousness is. We don't understand how consciousness came about, right? So there are all these kind of things that people assume are scientific certainties. And when you start to break them down, you realize that they're not. They're really just theories. And we... Apply this to like synchronicity. So it's like, I'm not going to say synchronicity is scientific. I'm not going to say it's necessarily a science. 
you know, I, I, I'm just more comfortable with saying like, it's, it's like game theory. It's like a, a kind of, uh, strategy game almost. I'm not comfortable saying that it's science just because I have deep respect for science. And I, I very much believe in the whole idea of like keeping science separate from mysticism. You know, it's like my, my motto is like, when you combine science with mysticism, you just end up with bad science and bad mysticism. You, know, you should keep them separate because they work differently. They, they follow different, different rules, you know, and you shouldn't try to conflate them, you know, like this whole idea that sort of arose with the theosophists and so on. So synchronicity again, I mean, it's like, I can't tell you like why it works the way it does or what's causing it or what's behind it. I just know it does. And I know there are just certain rules that if, if I follow these certain rules, that it will behave in a certain way and will produce certain results. And really at the end of the day, all I really care about is the results. You know, I only care about the results. It doesn't matter what's behind it. You know, it's the same thing with like, I don't understand how to, you know, fix a car. I just know that if I put gasoline in it, you know what I mean? I'm going to be able to drive it somewhere. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm, I just, I'm concerned about the usage. I'm concerned about the results. And it's kind of the same way I am with synchronicity. Because I think when you start to go off on tangents where you just start to theorize like what's behind this and where it comes from and all the rest of it, it just leads you absolutely nowhere, you know? And I think so much of new age, you know, and again, tying back to theosophy and so on, that when you try to make a science of mysticism, it just, it's, you know, it's like putting mustard on ice cream. You know what I mean? It just doesn't, it doesn't go. It's just two separate phenomenons that just are not you know, never going to come to pass together. You, you've got to follow the, these routes separately. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I wonder your thoughts on alchemy then, because I know so much of science was born out of that sort of interaction with what they thought were spiritual forces, and it end up, ended up creating this whole material science that, you know, really took a, a left turn away from what it seemed to be initially, which was at least at some point in time, there was this sort of conflation with spirituality and alchemy and, and mineralogy and geology, mining and such. Well, here's the problem with that. And I'll tell you exactly what the problem is, because I studied alchemy for quite some time. Nobody knows what all those texts mean. Nobody, you know, you can have sort of a general idea of what some of the symbolism is, but there's so many layers of symbolism beyond that, that when people say, oh, I know what they mean. I know, I know what this says. I know how to make this work. It's like, no, you don't. You know what I mean? It's like that, that language has been lost to us. You know, maybe you could pick apart certain things, but it's like, we don't know what they were saying. We don't know what they were thinking because the, everything was coded to such an extent, you know, everything was very deeply encoded to such an extent that we have lost the keys to that. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I'm not saying this as like, you know, somebody on the outside, it's, it's like, I read books on alchemy and so on. It's like, a, you know, this is when I was sort of like in my Jung phase, because Jung, Jung was always talking about alchemy, but Jung's whole idea of alchemy had nothing to do with ancient alchemy. He just took, you know, he, he sort of cherry picked a few symbols and then used it to to bolster his own ideas about like the collective unconscious and so on like that. That was an alchemy. We don't know. We don't know what they said. We don't know, you know, what they meant. The symbolism, for the most part, like I said, is is, is lost to us. Okay. So I, I expect that a lot of this was drug oriented. <laughs> so when you look at those texts and you look at the kind of things that they were, those guys were drawing and like, you know, just like all that art is extremely psychedelic. I think a lot of it was, was based in, in, in hallucinogenic drugs. We definitely see a modern day parallel with that for sure. So yeah, it makes sense. I've had Chris Bennett on the show who kind of talks about that in depth and how cannabis played a role in all of these alchemists lives is secretly and in some cases very openly tara you, you wanted to ask a question oh well, not a question but i was thinking about like how you were saying that you didn't like the, like what was showing up in the tarot and then with your son seeing the ufo and whatnot and i think that 
we have to be careful of what we're projecting maybe onto whatever it is we're doing and like how synchronicism is like a game and it's like how we show up to the game i guess defines how the game gets played or even if you have things like hanging out in your unconscious that haven't been brought to the conscious forefront they could lead you in a different direction than you consciously thought we're headed or you're consciously intending. I mean, I know what you're saying. And that's why, I mean, that's why I say that you, you need to develop like a certain strategy and rules that you follow, you know, at least with synchronicity. See, the problem, see, the interesting thing about synchronicity is it's, it's really something that you have like a greater sense of control over, right? So when you start to enter and like, when you start working on like, let's just use the example of tarot again, you know, you can become a whiz at, at the symbolism and the meanings of the cards and everything like that. But there's so much randomness attached to it. You know, everything is, is chance and the draw of the cards and the luck of the draw, all this kind of stuff. It's, I, I just think that there's a, a greater level of danger in that. Because you can't control that. And, and, and UFOs, I mean, forget about it. You know, I mean, it's like you can go out and you look for UFOs every night. I mean, there are people who have spent their entire lives going out and looking for UFOs and have never seen one. And then there are people who weren't even looking and have seen like, you know, UFOs five, six, seven, eight times. You, you see what I'm saying? It's just like we have no control over that. And that's why, like, it used to be this thing with the, the, uh, the skeptics. It's like, oh, there's a UFO. Quick, grab the worst camera that you can find. It's like, no, nerd boy, you know, kitty fiddler. That's not how it works. It's like nobody walks around with like the kind of camera equipment that you need to take a picture of something in the night sky. I mean, that's like a very specific kind of uh, machinery that you have to know how to work. And most people are just going to, you know, people just walk around and they see something in the sky and they're going to pull out their phones and they're going to take a picture of it. You know what I mean? That's how it works. It's not like, oh, you know, there are these roving bands of ufo hunters walking around with you know all this expensive equipment all over the place you know it's just it's just because you can't anticipate something that just doesn't care about you I mean, that's, a, that's the thing that i really realized came to realize about ufos is that whatever isn't you know whatever phenomenon or intelligence is behind it just doesn't give a shit about us you know what i mean it's just like they come and go you know we can never figure out what's what's going on and people will see ufos over like some battlefield where like hundreds of thousands of people are killed in one day or you know whatever i mean they just don't care whatever intelligence is behind that just doesn't have any interest in us and uh, you know you can go into the whole thing with abductions and so on and so forth that's kind of like another discussion but, you know, my feeling about UFOs is just like, we can't control them and they don't care about us. So what, what's the point, you know, what's the point in worrying about it? All right. Yeah. Agreed. And wise words. I'm wondering, you know, before we wrap up here on the 79 to 2022, what's the connection there? Because I went and I listened to some music from uh, that era today, a rock of 1976 to 1979. And I heard songs like Devil Woman, Tarot Woman. That's a funny coincidence. And a couple other songs that had like this weird, you know, not too uh, untypical of that time, but kind of magic occult theme. You will. Yeah. I mean, it was all over the place back then. So the thing with, with 2022, so I did this whole thing with 1983 and I forget how I even got started on that, but I did this whole thing in 1983. And then I did like these playlists on my secret history of rock and roll blog. And I, and I put together a bunch of playlists because, you know, I just realized that it was a very crucial year for music and so on. And, you know, 79 is the same way. It's like, you know, the thing that I realized about 79 is like, Hardcore punk, you know, new thrash metal, hip hop, industrial, you know, all these genres really, I, I, w I wouldn't say that they were invented in 1979, but they really sort of came into their own. It's like they, they became uh, their own thing rather than subgenres of some other form. And that's something that I haven't even considered before. But the thing that really got me started on 79 was. So having lived through that year and, and being like a precocious kid who read, you know, Time Magazine cover to cover when it came into, you know, my mother had a prescription to it. The thing that I realized is it's just like what's going on today reminds me so much 
1979. You know, we've got this very weak president who, you know, can't seem to get a handle on events. We have like this looming Cold War starting up again. You know, a lot of people want to go to uh, war with Russia over the Ukraine, which to me is just an absolute insane abomination. I mean, I don't care what the hell happens to Ukraine, to be honest with you. You know, we have the inflation, we have the supply chain crisis, we have, you know, these high, uh, sky high gas prices. We just have this very pervasive mood of pessimism and depression and despair, but also, you know, being fed through the whole social media network. And then also just this, this weirdness, you know, this kind of weirdness that has become part of our lives through all these rituals that have been performed, you know, really since at least the year 2000, you know, that sort of started this whole era of like these very occult ridden halftime shows and award ceremonies and, and all this kind of thing. So it's just like all these different characteristics that kind of define 1979 are all of a sudden popping up again this year. And it's very strange to me. It's like, why is this happening? How is this happening? Because in 1979, it's hard for a lot of people to understand, particularly people who are much younger like yourself, is that people just kind of resign themselves that, you know, World War III was just around the corner. We're all going to be nuked. And that's kind of like how people just generally tended to feel. I mean, I didn't feel that way because I, I sort of understood that the whole idea of you know, nuclear annihilation kinds of went against human nature, basic human nature. But people, you know, really felt that. Um, people felt like the whole American experiment was sort of grinding to a halt. I mean, this was three years after the bicentennial. You know, a lot of American industries were really sort of starting to fail. And also, there's just a tremendous amount of violence. Revolutions all over the world, wars. I mean, Vietnam went to war with both China and Cambodia. Revolutions in Rhodesia, Nicaragua, and then there was the IRA thing going on in, in Great Britain and Ireland. I, it was just a lot of violence, but there was just like a lot of just street fights and, you know, kids just fighting all the time. And, and just, it was really crazy. And I came to realize that I think a lot of it had to do with the lead and the gasoline you know, because unleaded gasoline didn't really show up for a couple of years. And th there've been a tremendous amount of studies that have proven that lead and gasoline creates violence in young men, especially, you know, it, it creates a propensity to violence, you know, by the way it interacts neurologically with the brain. reminds brains. me so of uh, the Mad Hatters that were up in my state in Derby, Connecticut. They had, I guess, lead and mercury that they were using to tan hats and, you know, in the hat making industry. And this term Mad Hatters was kind of loosely associated with people who had lost their mind from working in those industries. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. 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 And, you know, I just remember this, this crazy violence and just random violence was just something you always had to kind of be aware of. You know, for instance, I mean, this isn't, this was late 78, but I remember I was going to my first rock concert and it was the first time I got high going to see the Doobie Brothers down in Providence Civic Center. And there was somebody shooting at cars from the roadside and actually shot off the tire, the back tire on the car that I was in. And then like this whole weird thing happened where like my friend's next door neighbors drove up to see what was going on. And it's like, oh, we realized that what's that. I mean, they took us to the concert and they took us back. It was like the strangest night of my life. But, and I remember like one night, and this is definitely in 79, you know, we were coming back from, from youth fellowship and like the youth pastor was driving my sister and I to my grandma's house and somebody just threw like a rock at the windshield, like the whole windshield shattered. And it's like, shit like this just happened all the time. I remember like there were people dropping rocks from overpasses in 1979. It was just all this like weird, crazy kind of violence. And there was also that, you know, that influence, like there was a lot of occult and esoteric stuff in the culture. And, you know, also in people practicing this kind of stuff. So, you know, it was a very weird and dangerous time. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why all this interesting art came out of it. You know, it's like all this interesting music and film. And this is like 
every comic book movie now, like the whole comic book, the whole, you know, the last vest, vestige of Hollywood power being pinned on comic books was really like, came from 1979. There are two comics in particular with the X-Men and Daredevil, which was sort of like the basis for the entire rehaul of the industry. That was in 79 and so on. So there's all this stuff going on. And unfortunately, like we're kind of living through 1979 but we're just getting all the bad stuff and not the good stuff. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. it's a very weird, very weird time. But um, gone from lead poisoning to LED poisoning, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to tell you something. <clears throat> so when I was putting together a lot of these playlists, you know, I haven't posted them yet, but I was, and I did this for the '83 stuff. So I go back and I look at like these like concert videos from 1983 or '79 or whatever, and I look at these people. And it's just like, you know, just regular fans going to see a concert and everything. And they look like, they almost look like, uh, I don't know, like Spartans or something compared to what you'd see at a concert now. It's like, you know, people were not obese. People didn't spend all their time inside staring at computer screens. You know, people weren't on all these chemicals and drugs and so on. You know, people weren't on all these hormones and all this trans stuff. You know, it was basically expected of, of every kid to kind of like spend a lot of time outside, you know, riding bikes and building tree houses and all this kind of stuff. And that's like, that's all gone, you know? And I think a lot of it has to do with like, there was a lot of violence against children, you know, there were kidnappings and this, this sort of spread out into the, into the eighties and so on that the people who were raised like in that period became like overcautious parents because they just were so traumatized by, you know, like Johnny Gosh or something, you know, like these well-publicized kidnapping cases and, and serial killers and just all this kind of stuff that, you know, people who were sort of programmed by that when they were younger, you know, became very cautious or, or over overly cautious parents and stuff. And that sort of created like, this new generation of kids, you know, the snowflake generation, a lot of whom are, you know, extremely unhealthy. A lot of whom are, are born on the spectrum, which I think has to do with fertility drugs. And I have good reasons to believe that, by the way, I think a lot of the autism spectrum disorders that we're seeing are direct results of, of fertility treatments. And that, that's a whole other different conversation, but I have good reason to believe that. So, I mean, it's just like the whole culture has totally changed, you know? I mean, people expected, you know, you were going to have your fun and then you were going to get a job and get married and have kids, you know? And that's just what you did. I mean, how many younger people think that today? I mean, like marriage rates, birth rates are, have never been lower in this country's history. So, I don't know, man. It's like, like I said before, it's like we've got all this negative stuff going on, but, you know, I'm not seeing the positive stuff yet. I mean, I encourage like, you know, there was that big anti-mandate rally in Washington today. You know, stuff like that is, you know, we've seen all these massive rallies in Europe that I'm just really, I'm just so encouraged by and so excited about. Because it isn't just about resisting a mandate or, you know, you know vaccine passes or whatever. It's about standing up for, you know, freedom and autonomy. Absolutely. And, you know, and seeing just how like the, you know, the French in particular are really just on the cutting edge of this. I mean, they just had enough, you know, they've had enough of the nanny state. They've had enough of soft totalitarianism. They've had enough of, you know, globalism and all this kind of stuff. The first um, thing I thought of when the whole pandemic kicked off was this might be in response to that whole yellow jacket movement. That was very much a French thing, but it definitely spilled over and influenced other countries as well. But you saw that in 2019, that same sort of thing happening. I was saying, well, maybe well, they were I'm going to just, I'm just going to say this when it, when it comes to COVID and stuff. I remember, I don't know if you're familiar with Gordon White. Of course. Yeah. He was just on the show. Okay. I've got to check that episode out. Uh, but yeah, you know, he, he's he's very good at understanding economics, right, and so on. And you know, he's been kind of ringing the alarm bell for, for quite some time now about you know entitlements, social security, pensions, you know, all these things that are going to have you know a very profound negative effect, a drag on the economy because those all those programs were created when like people would live to like sixty five, seventy. I know. Now people are living to like. So before this all started, you know, and again, I, 
Gordon and I were discussing this and we were talking about like the, the entitlement crisis that was going to hit, oddly enough, the, the same, uh, yeah, we're talking about in the United States, the same states that had the worst COVID crises in these nursing homes and so on were coincidentally the, the states that had the greatest exposure because of entitlements and, you know, public employee pensions and so on, you know, civil servant pensions and so on. So for some reason, you know, it was almost like a, a fantastic stroke of luck <laughs> for New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Washington State and California and so on and so on, that just as they were looking down the barrel of insolvency because of these pensions, you know, for people who were living 10, 15, 20 years past life expectancies when, again, when all these programs were created, you know, gosh, darn it. Just, uh, they, they had like the incredible stroke of luck that COVID hit and, and cleared off the entitlement roles in, 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 in a lot of ways. You know, it took a lot of that deadwood, that financial deadwood off the, you know, the accounts payable list. You know, all these people who worked for 15 years as a school janitor and, and were paid full salary until they were 90. Gosh darn it. I mean, all these people just started dropping like flies and uh, it really saved the bacon, particularly in New York and, and New Jersey and Connecticut. Gosh darn it. I mean, all these people if they hadn't have died of COVID, would have uh, very possibly bankrupted the, um, the, all these states' economies. Can you imagine that? It's just really, it's, uh, talk about synchronicity already. I mean, it is a synchronicity for one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, gosh darn it. I mean, all these states that were really, uh, like I said, about to uh, stare down the barrel of, of insolvency, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to say in, in regards to the human cost and so on, but boy, they, they just got their, their fat pulled right out of the fire by COVID. Can you imagine the, the synchronicity there? It's just really, truly amazing. Right. So yeah. uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So definitely it always goes back to the money. Money. <laughs> see, but here's the thing. Money is just a symbol. Right. Well, first of all, so money is a symbol system, right? And it's just, it, it's meant to be a symbol of, it's supposed to be like connected to, to wealth, you know, it's, you know, gold reserves or whatever. And then at some point, I, I guess maybe in the seventies, it just became attached to nothing. And, you know, for the past 50 years, money has just been completely, it appears out of the clear blue sky, really. I mean, uh. I, I don't know what, what it's tied to anymore. I don't know what the dollar is really tied to anymore, you know? And, you know, it seems for some strange reason, if you go along with the program, you know, they, all, all these dollars are just thrown at you in truckloads. It's just, it's really amazing, but it, it's a, it's a form of magic and, you know, it can be, and I, I would argue very strongly that it is today. It's a form of black magic. You know, for instance, my friend, Tracy Twyman, the late Tracy Twyman, you know, had written a book about this and, and talked about how, you know, that money was really a form of, of, of ancient magic going very far back into the ancient world. So, you know, there you go. It's, it's always just amazing to me. You know, it's like, I don't understand that magic. It's, you know, it's like, I'm not a materialistic person at all, which is kind of my downfall, but I, I don't understand, you know, the way it works today and how it just, money just appears out of nowhere and people get paid, you know, phenomenal sums of money for doing next to nothing. It's, it's, that's, that's a form of sorcery as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah, definitely feels that way. And, and what you said, you know, that we touched on a couple times about how this ancient sorcery has moved its way into the new thought, new age movement. I mean, you know, I hear some of these channelers when they speak and it doesn't sit right with me. Space Brothers and yeah. the Ashtar Command and all that. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, it's funny to me because one of the things I talk about uh, when I'm doing some of this historical work is, you know, how the new age kind of pops up in this window that I talk about, the 79 to 83 window. But now today, the new age, you know, it got kind of big in like the late 80s and 90s as a thing, right? 
And now like people think, oh, it's not really a thing anymore. But these people who say that don't remember what the pre-New Age world was like. Because if you remember what the pre-New Age world was like, you will realize that New Age has completely, I mean, it's like the Borg. It's taken over the entire culture. It's everywhere to the extent that people don't even notice it anymore. So you have like, so the more extreme emanations of that, like, you know, the Space Brothers and the Ashtar come in. But, but just look at the fact that, you know, every major town or city is going to have at least one Whole Foods, right? It's going to have several yoga studios. It's going to have acupuncture, which is covered by insurance now. It's going to have chiropractic. It's going to have flotation tanks. Uh, it's going to have psychic storefronts. And the new age has become so ubiquitous, so totalizing, and so just omnipresent that people don't even think about it anymore. They think, oh, the new age was just that thing back in the 90s, or whatever. It's like, no, it's, it's taken over your entire world. It, it is like the Borg. It's assimilated the world, or the world is assimilated in it. I'm not exactly sure, but, you know, it's everywhere now. I mean, just the fact, like I said, that you have hundreds, if not probably millions of people practicing yoga now. And if you practice yoga, like back then you were like, you were probably living in California because <laughs> you know I mean? it was a weird thing that people weren't really into and people weren't really into health food or acupuncture. And I think I'm going to have to write a book about it because it just always stuns me that if you ask people about the new age, well, maybe not anymore. It's interesting because the new age sort of became a thing again with like when the press was going after all the Q people, you know, then all of a sudden everybody was new age. <laughs> all of a sudden new age was a thing again when they had sort of this target, when they wanted, they were targeting the Q people and so on. But, you know, it's just everywhere. And we, we don't understand. I mean, I, I lived through, I mean, I was there for pre-internet and pre-cable and pre-new age and pre-this and pre-that. And a lot of times I have, trouble remembering, you know, what the world was like before that, you know, it was just like, things have changed so much in such a fundamental level that it is kind of hard to imagine. But, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot, you know, but sort of like in my more private groups is like, you know, I talk about how like, it's really starting to feel like reality is changing too. So like sort of the externals and the, the dressing and the you know, sort of the accoutrements of reality have changed, in, you know, in so many ways in my lifetime. But now I'm really starting to feel that like reality is changing and it's kind of becoming a little bit unfixed. You know, it's, it's starting to, it, you know, I always feel like it's becoming a little unstable. And I wonder if it's like it always was, but we just didn't perceive it because we really didn't have the tools to perceive it or, or if this is something new. And it's definitely something that I've been really thinking about for the past five years now is just how the way, how reality works in ways that I, I have definitely not been accustomed to in my 50, 55 years on this planet. You know, I'm just, it's, things are different now. Things are, are, are working and, and behaving differently. You know, my private group, we call it the shimmer, you know, sort of based on the shimmer and, and annihilation. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously not that dramatic, but, you know, it really is. It is like that. And, and getting back to what we're talking about, 79, I mean, this whole concept really became known to at least like certain kind of art house cineasts through the Tarkovsky movie, uh, Stalker, because there's a movie in 1979 about this process that I'm describing now, which you know, is really kind of fascinating to me, you know, I mean, who knows, but a lot of people, a lot of people are feeling it, but they can't really articulate it. I mean, a lot of people like, you know, like, you know, time is moving too fast. Like time just is moving at such a clip that I'm not used to, you know, and, but, you think, well, you're older and you're just naturally going to think that. Like, but my kids will say that too. You know, like young people will say that. It's like time is just moving too fast. What happened to time? It doesn't feel the way it used to, you know? And I would just say, like, that if you want to slow down time, you know, cannabis is it's a great way to get time to behave itself a little bit better, right? <laughs> you know?
<laughs> yeah. the way that, you know, you're accustomed to when you were younger. But uh, yeah, so we really are, we really are at a very interesting time in our history. So like I said, I mean, 79 was, if nothing, like if you were going to ask me like one word to describe it, I would say like apocalyptic. That was like the mood. It was a very apocalyptic mood. You know, and what happened is that, you know, Reagan was elected in 1980 and just went on this huge borrowing spree, just like borrowed trillions of dollars. So like the the government just used deficit spending to kind of lift itself out of this bog that we, we sort of descended into. And that, you know, we had like a, a very prosperous time up until, gee, 9-11, 2001. <laughs> for some reason, this is when it all started to fall apart for some reason. Can you imagine? I don't know. but. Like I said, I mean, that was a very apocalyptic time. The way I'm kind of feeling now is that it seems like, maybe not as dramatically, but in its own way, equally as apocalyptic, but I'm just not sure how we get out of it this time. You know, how we get out of the pit this time. You know, one of the things when I talk about apocalypse, you know, I, I talk about, basically what I mean is like things become revealed at the end of cycles. Everything is cyclical. Everything lives, dies, and is reborn, right? And that's just the way of nature. But it, you know, the, the underlying reality sort of becomes revealed, unveiled, just, you know, the actual Greek word apocalypse, you know, starts to be, you know, the, the reality behind the curtain starts to become revealed as we reach these ends of cycles, you know? And there've been a, a lot of apocalypses, you know? I mean, a kind of apocalypses that we think of like, when you think of the word apocalypse, you just think like the end of everything. Now, you know, for instance, in uh, the sixth century AD, we, you know, there was the explosion of Krakatoa and that created this, basically this kind of nuclear winner for a very long time, it was, you know, people, millions of people died from starvation because you couldn't grow crops in this. And interestingly enough, we have the, the, the explosion of the volcano at Tonga this year, or just recently. So it's just like, these things tend to follow patterns. And, you know, one of the, the good benefits of, of studying synchronicity is that you'll start to learn these patterns. And, and when these things start to repeat themselves, you know, you're going to have a, a, a much deeper perspective on it and it'll kind of like, you know, it's going to chill you out a bit, you know, just, you're not going to get as worked up by it because you just understand that this is the ebb and flow of the natural world. You know? Right. Right. And, you know, it takes me back to the etymology behind that word ceremonial, you know, Ceres was the Roman god of, of harvest and fertility, right? So we see these things sort of happening in a cyclical nature as do the seasons when you practice agriculture. But, you know, on the point of uh, recent stories, I want to know your thoughts because with this idea of things quickening, it almost brings to mind the hundredth monkey effect. And then we have this story out of Danville, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, where a hundred mm -hmm. monkeys escape. And, you know, Pennsylvania, it's on the Susquehanna River. My friend Michael mm -hmm. Juan has made so many very interesting connections to the Susquehanna River through his research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, I mean, wow. What are your thoughts on that story that came out recently? Well, I'm just hoping that it's, yeah. You know, just a bunch of ordinary monkeys getting loose. You know, I'm hoping it's not a black swan event mm. because at times like this, you know, when we're sort of at this point in the story, you know, we're in this act of the story, you do see black swan events uh, that nobody could anticipate and that are, are just major game changers. You know, like I was talking about in the sixth century, the explosion or the eruption of Krakatoa right. and that the entire world was changed by that. You know, I mean, that's, that's really what caused the dark ages. I really am grateful for everything you've shared with us so far. I mean, the, the synchromistic knowledge, when people think of synchromysticism, they often reference you and, and all the work you've done and, and the numerous podcast appearances that many of us have gained so much from. So people go to the Secret Sun Institute. Chris has got plenty of stuff for you to chew on and, you know, everything from pop culture to ancient mystery cults and everything in between. But 
Yeah, Chris, this has been uh, a pleasure like the first time. Thank you for, for joining me. No, it was uh, a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Well, with that, folks, thank you so much for being here and enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now. Hey, everybody, while you're there on your phone, go over to our link tree and check out our merch store. We've got so many awesome designs for you to wear on your chest and show the world that your family thinks you're crazy. Thanks for supporting the show. All right. Thank you for sticking with us. And how could you not? When Chris Knowles is on the show, what a conversation. I don't know what to say, truly. In the notes, I told him that I would like to talk about Manly P. Hall. I told him I'd like to talk about his message to the mystics and the synchro mysticism and all that good stuff. And, you know, I just, once the conversation gets going, it just goes where it goes. We went all over the place and so many things that I didn't expect and quite honestly felt unprepared for. But how could I not when, you know, talking to someone as knowledgeable as Mr. Knowles is? I mean, he's the author of several awesome books, some fiction, some nonfiction. I actually have one of his fictional accounts. But I don't know, if you learn a thing or two about Chris's life, you might realize that that book was autobiographical in some ways. I'm talking about his book, He Will Live Up in the Sky, several others, including Our Gods Wear Spandex, and The Endless American Midnight. And may I remind you, folks, of Chris Knowles' laws, the Knowles laws. Knowles' first law, whenever a controversy, sorry, whenever a controversy over symbolism erupts in the media, it's usually disguising a completely different symbolic, symbolic message altogether. Knowles' second law, the old state cults will be reestablished under the cover of woke. No... <laughs> Knowles' third law, the old statues and symbols currently being torn down will eventually be replaced by the icons and idols of the new slash old state cult. And then finally, Knowles' law on UFOs, which did make its way in today's conversation, not the law, but UFOs. The probability that a UFO story is a deliberate hoax is correlative to the amount of mainstream media coverage it receives. So I don't know why I was compelled to read those, but I think Mr. Knowles has a lot of information to share. And, you know, today's conversation had a lot of critique and opinion in it, but I think that is needed. You know, when you're looking at a book like I do, like the 50 greatest conspiracies of all times or secret societies and psychological warfare by Michael Hoffman, you know, it's maybe easy as just a solitary reader to get wrapped away thinking this is all true or this person was all right. And it's really cool to have a second opinion. And, you know, oftentimes those second opinions are people in our family or peers who aren't even familiar with this subject to begin with. So what is their, you know, criticism really matter at all? You know, like that, when we have someone like Chris Knowles who's been studying this stuff, he cuts his teeth with conspiracy culture, okay? Way before I was even born, all right? I like to hear that. So I encourage people to still go and buy those books and obviously buy them after you buy one of Chris's books. I mean, come on here, folks. I would say Endless American Midnight, which... I misspoke. I do have a PDF, which Chris was kind enough to send me prior to the first interview. And also in conjunction, I think, with the Tinfall Hat interview. And I looked through that. Fantastic work. You know, not quite a book in and of, in and of itself in the same way He Will Live Up in the Sky is. But it's a collection of some of the really juicy things that he's put together over the years on his Secret Sun blog. And he kind of hinted at this shimmer group here. I don't know, Chris, if you're listening to this, brother, let me in on that. That sounds cool. I want to be in a secret 
research group. Speaking of research groups, we've got our Telegram chats where folks are communicating all sorts of awesome memes and information, personal stories, connections to the show, synchronicities even, something that we also talked about today. And like I said towards the beginning, I've had this book uh, written by Manly P. Hall, and yeah, it's it's cute. Okay, I have the same middle name as him, so what? Big deal. But I really have always been struck by his work, and it's really cool. You know, this is uh, something that quite honestly made me feel like an outcast when I was getting into it, because my friends would see me, you know, with these big books in my room, like, what are you reading, you know? And, uh, and they were just there to smoke pot. They didn't realize that they were entering into my wizard chamber. And, and yeah, so at, for a while there, you know, it just felt like I was reading this stuff to no avail. And now I like hit myself on the back of the, the wrist, like, damn it, I should have read more. Cause when I talk to guys like Chris Knowles, I'm just blown away. Now some things, <clears throat> excuse me. Some things from that chapter that we mentioned, chapter uh, 12, Ceremonial Magic and Sorcery. Sorry, chapter 22. Ceremonial magic is the ancient art of invoking and controlling spirits by a scientific application of certain formula. A magician, enveloped in sanctified vestments and carrying a wand inscribed with hieroglyphic figures, could by the power vested in certain words and symbols control the invisible inhabitants of the elements and of the astral world. While the elaborate ceremonial magic of antiquity was not necessarily evil, there arose from its perversions several false schools of sorcery or black magic. Egypt, a great center of learning and the birthplace of many arts and sciences, furnished an ideal environment for transcendental experimentation. Here, the black magicians of Atlantis continued to exercise their superhuman powers until they had completely undermined and corrupted the morals of the primitive mysteries. By establishing, by establishing a sacerdotal caste, they usurped the position formerly occupied by the initiates and seized the reins of spiritual government. Thus, black magic dictated the state religion and paralyzed the intellectual and spiritual activities of the individual by demanding his complete and unhesitating acquiescence in the dogma formulated by the priest craft. The pharaoh became a puppet in the hands of the Scarlet Council, a committee of arch sorcerers elevated to the power by the priesthood. These sorcerers then began the systematic destruction of all keys to the ancient wisdom, so that none might have access to the knowledge necessary to reach adeptship without first becoming one of their order. They mutilated the rituals of the mysteries while professing to perverse them, so that even though the neophyte passed through the degrees, he could not secure the knowledge to which he was entitled. Idolatry was introduced by encouraging the worship of the images which in the beginning the wise had erected solely as symbols for study and meditation. False interpretations were given to the emblems and figures of the mysteries, and elaborate theologies were created to confuse the minds of their devotees. The masses, deprived of their birthright of understanding and groveling in ignorance, eventually became the abject slaves of the spiritual impostors. Superstition universally prevailed, and the black magicians completely dominated national affairs, with the result that humanity still suffers from the sophistries of the priestcrafts of Atlantis and Egypt. Fully convinced that their scriptures sanctioned it, numerous medieval Kabbalists devoted their lives to the practice of ceremonial magic. The transcendentalism of Kabbalists is founded upon the ancient and magical formula of King Solomon, who has long been considered by the Jews as the prince of ceremonial magicians. Among the Kabbalists of the Middle Ages were a great number of black magicians who strayed from the noble concepts of the Sefer Yasera and became enmeshed in demonism and witchcraft. They sought to substitute magic mirrors, consecrated daggers, and circles spread around posts of coffin nails for the living of that virtuous life, 
which without the assistance of complicated rituals or sub-mundane creatures, unfailingly brings man to the state of true individual completion. Those who sought to control elemental spirits through ceremonial magic did so largely with the hope of securing from the invisible world either rare knowledge or supernatural powers. The little red demon of Napoleon Bonaparte and the infamous oracle heads of De Medici are examples of the disastrous results permitting elemental beings to dictate the course of human procedure, while the learned and godlike demon of Socrates seems to have been an exception. This really proves that the intellectual and moral status of the magician has much to do with the type of elemental he is capable of invoking. But even the demon of Socrates deserted the philosopher when the sentence of death was passed. I should note, uh, and this is Mark speaking, should note the point about Napoleon Bonaparte's interesting because I've heard recently from researcher Walter Bosley that a lot of that stuff pinning Napoleon as an evil person uh, was propaganda from the British. And we have to keep in mind that Manly P. Hall was born in Canada a pretty much a arm of Britain at that time, at least more so than maybe today. But who knows? That is debatable. Either way, it is. It's also interesting that he talks about Socrates having a more benevolent version of the same thing. If he's maybe bent towards Socrates again, this is all stuff that I wish I could ask Chris. But you know, the nature of conversation. I ask certain things and then time flies and we go into a whole nother realm and I'm working on it, folks. You know, this is only episode 130 something and I, I really, I love doing this type of thing, but I'm new in a lot of ways. It's kind of talking these ideas out with someone as knowledgeable as Chris is very challenging for me, especially considering, you know, I want to be as respectful as I can and not try to be like a know-it-all uh, that's kind of how i operated for the longest time because a lot of people that i would talk to this stuff with just didn't know uh anything about it at all which always bothered me because it just gave me too much free reign with my ideas and you know kind of blurred the line between th what's real and what's theory and Hence why I love talking to a guy like Chris, because he's been looking at this stuff for so long. He has just this really strong conviction, but also a very strong sense of discernment. And he, all with this sort of East Coast flavor that I appreciate, obviously, being a fellow New Englander. He's outside of the grip of New England now, but he is from Mass, I believe, right? That's what we talked about in our first conversation if you're listening to this on chris's patreon thank you for sticking with me here into the extended outro if you like this kind of thing go and check out our podcast my family thinks i'm crazy you can search it in any podcast app we have a rockfin channel we have a youtube channel and most importantly we have a patreon where we put all of our episodes out early you get access to our private telegram chat for just the patrons and you also get access to a monthly meeting. So if that sounds like your thing and you're already on Patreon, join on over there for as little as three, four, five dollars a month. You get every episode early and a bunch of other really cool things too. So, and at the very least, check out the show. It's free. And uh, Chris has been on twice now. So here we are in the extended outro for the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. So many people showing us love on Instagram and Telegram and Patreon. And we appreciate you. Keep sending the messages in. And for now, folks, that does it. Uh, thank you for being here and enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now. <laughs>